Yeah, um, maybe just a remark, in hater than a question. Uh, because you, okay, sorry. Maybe just a remark, hater than a question. Uh, it was quite complicated for me to see when you present that uh, export-oriented or substitution of import, of import didn't uh, work for some country, for example, for Latin America. And as we are discussing uh, very well here, it's very complicated to say that it didn't work without uh, analyzing the specifications uh, of the countries and of Latin America itself. Because every time that a country of Latin America, Brazil, for example, uh, that started to grow or to have a success in the developing process, we had uh, many external interventions. Mm -hmm. And then I think that uh, we need to be careful to say that it, something happened or didn't happen or didn't succeed mm -hmm. in some specific country without analyzing the whole context. Then I think that, uh, for example, in Latin America, the substitution of importation did uh, succeed for sometimes uh, in a certain degree. Uh, but yeah, we have a political aspect that needs to be included on this analysis. Mm -hmm. And if there is something that we can uh, learn from China, it's what you just said, it, to follow our own path of development, rather mm -hmm. than look on different paths of development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so um, in, uh, I'm actually Brazilian, in, so I, I, I'm, I went to the U.S. to do my Ph.D. and I did focus on Latin America for my thesis um, in the Ph.D. Uh, and yes, yeah, certainly there are, um, there are other factors and in no, in no moment I think it's the Latin American countries problem or fault that it didn't work is just that when we look historically uh, since post World War II, um, these models and in my, my theory is that because they are imposed from outside without understanding the specificity of the countries, these models have failed. Uh, but it's not because uh, of the fault of any particular country and failed, it doesn't mean that, th that for sure Brazil had the miracles age of growth. Um, but um, I, I will qualify what I said and I know I use this word, sustainable sustainable development. That means that it's not 20 years of economic growth. It is that you would continue to do well. And what we see in Latin America is what Latin American, uh, um, several Brazilian economists like Maria Conceição Tavares has said, uh, it's the stop and go growth. It's, it's always in this oscillation. So it's not sustainable. So, um, yeah, but I, yeah, I think you need, uh, we always need to understand other countries and look at the specificity and the pro problem of economic theory is that they believe that we have one model that applies for everybody and we are going to impose this model and this is going to work and everybody is going we're going to have a convergence um, is even a convergence something desirable is my question <laughs> um, anyway So could you hear me well? Yeah. OK, perfect. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I think it was quite insightful. And also thank you for the discussion and the questions that you just posed. Um, I just want to add to the discussion a bit, because for me, um, coming from Pakistan and seeing how Belt and Road Initiative has actually been like a prominent strategy for China to penetrate into the country, and I do feel that when you're talking about uh, Confucianism, international law, uh, because China has also could be seen in terms of being an epitome of uh, relational governance through its political transformation and its uh, foreign alliances with the countries. 
So for example, in case of Pakistan, having like 70 years of uh, you know, friendship and relationship, and how through Pakistan it has been able to have these multilateral regional links with Euro-Asia, for example, with Afghanistan, with Iran, um, and um, you know, maybe more countries to add on to. So this is how it has been able to cause a paradigmatic shift and have the cultural embeddedness in terms of many ways. So in terms of education, in terms of political uh, penetration within the country, and changing the structures as well, because a lot of policies in Pakistan have been according to Chinese uh, ways of, uh, uh, for example, setting up businesses, in terms of labor market being highly influenced according to what China actually wants within the country. Mm -hmm. So I think that when we're talking about uh, the unfolding of Chinese dream, considering international law and considering these foreign political alliances does uh, take a toll on uh, changing institutional structures. Like you said, that maybe it's not happening, but in case of Pakistan, in, in case of the regional control or hegemony that it is trying to, uh, uh, maybe not from a negative perspective, but in a way that it's trying to maybe change the new liberal uh, order or the new liberal uh, or creating a new world order it could be seen in that aspect and also when it uh, comes to sino centrality i think it goes back to the um, and i think you mentioned that in your paper when you talked about the orientalist approach and i could see that uh, during the han dynasty and maybe if i'm wrong about mentioning the name of the dynasty because i'm sure you know more than me about that but the silk route it's it's something which i do feel is part of the belt and road initiative or the Uber um, initiative that we see mm -hmm. um, nowadays, and currently it's being expanded to uh, all other countries as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's just uh, just to add to the discussion. Maybe if you mm -hmm. want to add something to it. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for your comments. I think that, um, and I have talked to other people in uh, countries closer to China, and for sure the relationship because china is really creating a it's be, is a regional power now and uh, the relationship with other asian countries is certainly different than the relationship china tries to establish with western countries um, so that's something to take into consideration uh, but one thing that I'm not sure that I wrote in the paper, but it's my perspective at this point is that um, wh while there are some differences between the Chinese model and the Western, uh, the Anglo-Saxon model, uh, because China, we, we have examples of financial direct investment done in the, um, um, uh, in the region, where they don't require structural changes. Like, so I needed to probably give some context, but if the IMF gives uh, a loan, they require specific things. So like you need to have a, a government deficit that is not greater than 6% of your GDP. Um, you have to have uh, a monetary policy that where your interest rate, so it's very specific. And uh, it's called uh, structural, um, structural adjustment uh, policies. Uh, and China does not do that. So uh, that's one difference. However, it doesn't matter what, whenever a country comes to another country, it can't get rid of its own culture. Right, so of course it's going to, uh, we all have our own background and we, we come with that. And of course it's going to, in a way or another, when there is an imperialist or a dominant nation, it is going to uh, bring its culture with it. And uh, that uh, lack of influence um, that, that doesn't exist in the real world, I think. So yeah, but it's to see, I think with the unfolding, what we needed to see is like, what is the intention of China in terms of political and economic institutions? Uh, because if, so far they say, it doesn't matter for us and in practice as well, if you're a democracy, if you are authoritarian government, like you have sovereignty to 
lead your nation the way you want. Uh, so, you know, that contrast, and I'm not saying this is good or bad, but that contrast with the Anglo-Saxon model. So, but yeah, culture, uh, wherever we go, we bring our culture with us. And if we are dominant, we we'll impose our culture on others, I think so. Uh, but maybe also to add to your point, because China is also like um, uh, the largest creditor for all the low income uh, countries. And it's like, 5.5 trillion, which is 6% of the global, 6% more than the global GDP or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. So I do feel that in some way, uh, and maybe Kamal wants to add to it in terms of, yeah. <laughs> I think we're gonna say the same thing, but uh, basically, no, I think I should keep it on. Uh, basically, uh, it's this problem that, uh, yes, there is a different model Right? And yes, this model is embedded in different social, uh, historical, and cultural dynamics. Uh, but let's, let's not be naive at the same time about how that plays out in other developing countries. I completely disagree with your comment that there's no structural adjustment coming from China. Uh, China's taken over ports in Sri Lanka. They've taken over ports in southern Africa. Um, and, and they do play the game of debt diplomacy. Uh, and I mean, we, we shouldn't be ignorant about this either, right? Um, and while it might be of a different shade and a different texture to the US and the IMF structural adjustments and the Washington consensus, they play hard power and they use debt to do that. And they use the infrastructure projects to do that. So mm -hmm. I just think we should, be, we, we should be clear about that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, well, uh, no, it's, you are right, we shouldn't be naive, and I hope uh, I'm not. <laughs> uh, someone who has studied empire for a while, I hope I'm not naive, but uh, yeah, maybe I didn't pass the message across, but... The last question? No, so... I want to, we want to thank Natalia. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me.